Institutions Committee. We have before us some members of the VSCA. They wanted to come in and give us um, an update in terms of, not so much an update, but their concern about the state colleges and the transformation plan, particularly in the um, adjustments that they're doing to the libraries in terms of putting the books on digital format. Um, and so we have a couple members of uh, the State Employees Union, and we have Elizabeth Bergman and Michelle Perry with us on Zoom. So welcome. We also have Steve Howard here in the uh, committee room. So I'll start with Elizabeth Bergman. If Elizabeth, you're willing to go first, uh, share with us your thoughts on their proposal. And if you could identify yourself for the record first, that would be great. Sure. My name is Elizabeth Bergman. I live in St. Johnsbury and I do the interlibrary loan for NVU Linden. Um, and I've done that for 11 years. I'm also an alum of Linden, but I'm speaking today as a private citizen. And the impact for the college's decision about the libraries becoming digital, I believe runs deeper than getting rid of books. It will affect the quality of the services for the students and the faculty and the surrounding communities. We're just coming back from the pandemic and both students and faculty are looking for more in-person experience and need more hand-holding. We have first-generation students who don't have family members to turn to for advice for colleges. And we have non-traditional students who are returning to school after years perhaps of being out of school and find that things have changed or, or just not what they expect. Now that they have a job and family, they'll be looking for extra in-person support. I've also heard that the staff, um, I've heard from various people that um, staff manage the collections. So by reducing the collection, we don't have much need for staff and that this will help um, with bu the budget situation, but this decision will mean fewer staff to help students, fewer people there to help with reference, answering phones, giving directions, unjamming the printer, putting in IT work orders, getting reserves for students, and any other things that might come up. Um, the staff do much more than just manage the collections. Student workers don't always show up, and they don't usually work over breaks, and not many work over the summer. So if all of this work is going to fall on just one or two people, that's a lot to fall on one or two people. And once that one person or both of those people need to be out sick or one person takes vacation, it's one person managing all of that. And if something else happens, you need a backup. That's still a lot for very limited staff. The college also promises that this is Will bring a wider accessibility for materials with the digital library. They also promise that this will save money. If the college is going to reduce their print collection by 70 or 80 percent, they'll have to build up its digital content so that students have adequate study material. Ebooks, not just periodicals. Not all books have been digitalized, especially in the academic field, and this will be expensive. They are at least as expensive, if not more so than print. Databases we know cost thousands of dollars and they usually have to be renewed perhaps yearly and most likely they will increase in price each year. This is not the same as what we currently have and students will not be able to have exactly the same. We have to think about what's, what an equi equivalent amount of material for the students are going to be. Right now also, anything that the library doesn't have, we can get from other libraries for the students through interlibrary loan, usually for free, because most libraries will agree to lend for, for free. Uh, but it is very hard to get a whole ebook through interlibrary loan. I have yet to successfully do that in my entire time of working here. Most libraries don't have eBooks or are not licensed to loan them. 
that is most likely the case. We are not licensed to lend our eBooks. Interlibrary Loan also works on a reciprocal basis. So we lend to them, they lend to us. So I also fear that with our limited collection and inability to lend eBooks, even if the public libraries are looking for that, that we won't have anything to offer the other libraries and they will eventually stop lending to us. They'll essentially stop doing business with us. And once we can't borrow from other libraries, the colleges will have to buy these materials for the students. And that's going to be more expenses. To give an idea, in the year 2018 to 19, we borrowed 572 items for Linden students and faculty. That's Linden alone, not the other campuses. This decision is also going to impact the community and the other libraries. Again, with interlibrary loan, as we said before, we won't be able to lend to other libraries since if we're going to be dealing with only digital, it's very hard to lend that. And we lend a lot of materials to libraries. We lend more than we borrow. We lend to the other campuses, to Vermont Public Libraries, and we lend out of state. In 1819, that year again, we lent 853 items. In the past 10 years, we've lent 7,852 items. And some of these went to big libraries out of state, such as Dartmouth Public, Boston Public, Ithaca, Salt Lake City Public, New York Public, and Cornell, just to name a few. These are libraries with a lot of money and a lot of material, but they had something, they needed something that we had and they opted to borrow rather than to buy it. But the VSC colleges are not thinking that way. And our community people also, surrounding communities also use our library for borrowing books, computers, printing and gatherings. We've had local authors come in to use the space. We've had homeschool groups use the building for meetings and projects throughout the year. We've had communities come in just to use the space while they're passing through. I'm not sure if the community will be able to use the space this way anymore. They won't be able to, to access the digital books the way they do the physical. And the renovations that are planned for the downstairs, I don't know what that's gonna look like and will the, the public be able to use that? I don't know. And I feel in rural Vermont, it's important to work with the communities as the colleges have so far. And I fear that this plan will separate us from the communities and not allow us to help and integrate as much as we have, which is important. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think we do have a few questions. Connor? Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, I actually used to represent you guys when I worked at PSEA many years ago, uh, so I have a real appreciation for the work you do. Um, kind of interested in your like, you know, personal situation and how all this rolled out on the ground. Um, are, are you, uh, have you been riffed? And when these decisions were made, what was the sort of level of engagement with frontline uh, employees to make these decisions? Um, this, this decision to go pretty much digital, how much, like, are you asking how much we Input played in in this? Yes. Am I, am I understanding that question? Yep, that's right. Pretty much it came as a surprise to us. The, the library had been working on a plan, a digital first, which had been, we were going to be bringing in more digital, keeping the physical, maybe weeding out some of the older um, print but bringing in more more digital, um, something not as drastic. And we had been working on this for maybe a year. And then a month ago, we were hit with this. This was not what we were planning. And it came as a surprise to, I, I believe, all of the staff. And has your position been eliminated? Yes. 
Thank you. Other questions? John? Are you giving similar testimony to the Education Committee? We have not been um, told about it or, or told of an opportunity to. If given an opportunity, that would be great. This is the opportunity that came up, which any opportunity is, is good as far as I'm concerned, I guess. Other questions? Elizabeth, and then we can transition to Michelle. Michelle, if you could just identify yourself for the record, that would be great. Welcome. Uh, my name is Michelle Perry. I live in Fairhaven, Vermont. I will be speaking as a private citizen today. I am in my 16th year in the library at Castleton University as the cataloger, archivist, and interim interlibrary loan supervisor. The library is a safe and welcoming space on campus for students, faculty, staff, researchers, authors, artists, and community members to spend their time. My question about President Graywall's proposed plan uh, to remove the physical books from the library is who and how will the proposed plan be implemented? Um, and further, how much money is really being saved by this proposed plan? Let's start with an overview of services currently provided to students and faculty that will be changed or eliminated by this plan. Reserves. The staff member responsible for creating reserves will no longer be employed by the VSC. This means no more reserve books set aside to be used for specific classes in a given semester. When there is no checkout system in place, how will the faculty's personal copies of books or other items be tracked? If personal copies, which is the largest number of items on reserve currently, are not returned, the library will have to replace them money that doesn't need to be spent. Physical books. According to the VSCS's administrative, administration's new plan, there will be books in the libraries to be used in the building, not checked out, and presumably put back on the shelves by the patron when they are done. First off, how are the books going to be found on the shelves? With 16 years of experience in this library, the expectation that the books will be returned to their original location alone would surprise me. Juvenile books are being intermingled with casual books. And we have faculty who have also addressed this to the public who put juvenile books on reserve so they should be considered academic titles in order to be properly cataloged. These neighborhood libraries are being handled with a take a book, leave a book policy. So how will students know if the juvenile book their professor assigned will be there? Relevant co collection. This is determined by deciding which books to keep and which books to remove. We all understand how important it is to have updated materials and a clean collection. We currently have a deselection criteria that has been followed for many, many years. A report is produced as defined by this well-prescribed administrative administered deselection process, which lists items that have not been used, either checked out or in-house in the last 10 years, and were not, have not been acquired in those 10 years as well. The report is set up to, to avoid problems that, will that you will find in the new plan. In regards to how long the item has been in the catalog, an item added in December 2022 shouldn't be considered for removal. And items that don't circulate, such as reference, archive, rare books, and at another library, such as the Vermont Room items. The proposed plan states that 58% of the collection has not circulated. There are currently 1,600, well, a few more items in the Castleton catalog that belong to four different departments on campus. These should not be in consideration as that 58% of non-circulated items. This deselection process is ongoing, but came to an almost complete halt due to staffing. This is the process. We run the report, we gather the items on the list, 
reference librarians go through to make the final decision. The cataloger removes them from the catalog, which is COHA, online holdings, which is OCLC, and finally from the building, which they are stamped, sent to the book sale, recycled. Um, for instance, a well, okay, uh, for instance, a well-known institution, BYU, Brigham Young University, presented a deselection project to our staff that took 10 years and they removed or moved fewer books than Castleton alone has. They moved about 70,000 books to be considered to, for removal. The physical space. The physical space may not be a service, but we listened to what students wanted. Nook space in the library didn't see, didn't want to be, oh, didn't want to be seen. That's what they were saying the nook space was. This is created by using the stacks of books. This is from a survey conducted by a class here on campus. I can only speak for Castleton. Other items they wanted, whiteboards, comfy seating, soundproofing, more outlets, et cetera. Castleton University was able to accommodate several of these at no cost to the library via a grant, reusing what we had and cleaning up our collection. The archives. The archives represent a closed collection, but I get requests several times a week. I started the project of creating an archive special collections room. This project and the knowledge of what and where items are leaves with me when my job is eliminated. Donors, we are so incredibly grateful for our donors. Our largest yearly supporter gives to the library with it written in his contract for his donation to be used for print books only. We put book plates in the front of all of the books that he purchases. Without his donation to the library, the matching donation will not be given to the general fund either. They're further eroding support for the colleges. There are 80 books that were purchased with donor money that are sitting in my office currently. Purchasing physical books. First off, there is no acquisitions person. Secondly, according to the president's plan, the only way a student can get a book is by having a documented disability. And then it will be purchased and sent directly to the student for their use only. Money that doesn't need to be spent. If they made the change, that book would be added to, into the collection. We run, oh, if the, they made the change that the book would be added to the collection, we run into the problem of no catalog. For example, in a sports related injury, concussion is not a documented disability, but the first thing recommended for their recovery is to forego screens. How would that student get access to the necessary reading materials in order to complete the work for that semester? Cloud storage. I have been begging IT to give me storage space for my archives and special collections, and I have been told there isn't any. I went to a recent conference in Middlebury, and this cloud space issue was addressed by suggesting a consortium be created for Vermont libraries to have space to, to have more cloud storage space to store digital, digitized items. There are private companies out there that provide the storage space and a faculty member even offered to cover it monthly for the library. But I was reminded that if this company was to go away, all of my irreplaceable items do too. This is also why it was recommended to keep the originals. Just a quick note, internet is not, accessi does not, is not accessible to all people in Vermont, whether it be um, the, the cost of it or where they actually live. So that's another concern of having access to these items. Federal work study funds. I recently learned that in order for an institution to qualify for federal work study funds, 7% of the jobs on campus have to be community service based. The library was always, has always provided those jobs, but is now unclear if any jobs in the library will be considered community based. I want to end this with a statement from the plan. This approach is consistent with the principles driving this transformation, student first, purpose first, digital first. Nowhere in this entire plan does it reflect the students' thoughts and requests. And when we started the transformation process, it was digital first, meaning acquiring electronic materials first, then physical resources if the item wasn't available or um, the patron preferred a physical copy. 
what happened to the original proposal, digital first, patron driven. But again, to reiterate one of my original questions, where are the supposed cost savings that are claimed by, the, by President Graywall and the VSCS administration? Thank you for listening. On behalf of myself and the other library staff, I am proud to work with. I strongly encourage this committee to ask the hard questions, to responsibly allocate the state's resources in support of higher education in Vermont. Please support the libraries of the Vermont State College System. Thanks again. Thank you, Michelle. Are there questions, comments from the committee at all? Just, Eric? What, what's the operation of the libraries look like right now? I mean, are you still staffed at the library? Um, yes, we are. We Our last day is June 30th, but um, we have not been instructed by our director or anybody else of what we're not supposed to do or do. The only things we learned about were in the paper. Um, so like I said, I have books sitting there just waiting to do what needs to be done with them. And I have been covering interlibrary loan and sending out physical books, so. And on, on June 30th, your positions are, are terminated, but are you folks been, are you gonna be, uh, does, I'm sorry, what was the word? Rift. Rift. Yes, yes. Well, on February 7th, I was rift along with two other people in my library and June 30th is our last day. And for me, it was myself and three others. So everybody on the Linden staff and then on the Linden campus were, were rift, to use your, your word. And so the Linden staff are still there, but looking at other position options and what, what we're going to have to do, we have until June 30th, where doing our job while we're there because there are students to serve and we want to give good service. I too am continuing interlibrary alone while I'm here because there's still requests coming in from our students and from other libraries. And when I'm not there, it will stop, I guess. And returning books I'm not sure what's going to happen, how they're going to be processed. Nobody, like Michelle said, nobody has given any sort of indication as to what the process for that's going to be for the straggling incoming stuff and figuring out any of that. Thank you. Alice, I've got a question. Okay, why don't you go ahead, Mary, and then Connor? I just, um, I just was wondering, based upon what you just barely said, so you've been given no directions as to what to do with the books that are under your care at this point. It's just kind of up in the air, yes? That's correct. We have been told nothing. Um, the only thing I heard was local libraries and local schools. Um, but again, it was all from the news. It wasn't from my supervisors or anybody at the administration level. Because I would be a bit concerned by the email that we received, I think the committee received today in regards to how this was going to roll out. And it talked about getting rid of 70, I think to 80% of the books. And then there would be on an honor system. And like you said in your testimony, I don't know how you quite do that in an honor system or how these books get put on the shelf or returned or whatever, where there's no system. So, you know, I, I just, it's, it's very disheartening hearing this, that there's still kind of not a plan if this is indeed what they're thinking they're going to do. Not that I agree with it, but, you know, they said there would be a plan in place. And I think I was a little bit more concerned and challenged as I read the recent email just th this morning, you know, was how to on an honor system in a college. I mean, I would hope that everyone would do that, but I can't quite imagine that will be the case. And what do you do actually with the books that are um, 
that you're getting rid of. It almost sounded like they were either going to be thrown out or or possibly given to someone, but I think there needs to be a better plan in place. I, I agree that the, there doesn't seem to be much plan that we have heard, and that is very disconcerting for all of us. And I'm sorry for that, being that you're longtime employees of these colleges that you've given, obviously, your heart and soul to. Thank you for that. Hmm. So, Connor? Uh, probably a more anecdotal question. I've seen numbers as far as, like, how many books are checked out a year. Uh, how many people, would you say, come in and out of a library uh, while school's in session there? Staff, students, community members? Oh, I wasn't prepared to answer that question. That's right. I'm putting you on the spot. Should have had that. We have a daily gate count. So, I mean, that's something we track. We're, you know, we have between during like, you know, if it's not break week, we probably have a hundred or more people come in every day. Uh, I would say the same. Lyndon also does a gate count. And so I usually check it every day and it's, it's probably about the same. The number is somewhere in the, in the hundreds. Thank you. So it's a follow up on that question. Do you think the other students, I mean, the body, student body is bigger than 100. Do you think the other students are accessing the information uh, from the library digitally or they're just not engaged? I do know that someone else um, that works at the library um, was looking at the numbers of recently purchased databases so that everyone had access to all the same things. And it was shockingly low on how often databases are used. And most of the time they're using them in the library because I don't know if they're not quite sure how to do it from their like dorm or whatever. It's just easier to come in and just open a computer and not have to worry about trying to log on, you know, mm -hmm. but. Lyndon also has not had a reference librarian on its own for a few years, for a couple of years. We've been sharing with, with Johnson and VU, and there has not been a person right there. So there hasn't been somebody teaching literacy information, which that person historically, especially before the pandemic, would go either into the classroom or the class would come to the, to the library. And that's where the students would get either a first overview or a more in-depth class of here's how you access the material on the library website. Here's how you look for articles and eBooks. Here's how you do some research. So without having somebody really showing the students how to do that, they can come to the library and have some help from us. But having somebody really show them how to do that, I think really diminishes their ability to be able to access on their own these things. It also lowers the count of what they're doing for interlibrary loan or just, or just the research that they're doing um, <laughs> in general. They don't have somebody guiding them. You know, some, some of the faculty know it, but the faculty don't aren't aren't taking a, a class and here's how you do the research with the library and all the databases so they can't teach the students that's what the that's what the librarians and the and the reference librarians for and this campus doesn't have one other questions Tristan I really appreciate your time I don't think I have a question and just since you took the time with us to share your stories and the detail information the numbers, the commitment to you, you have to the jobs you're doing. Uh, I just want to say that I appreciate that. Uh, I think sort of considering uh, the situation and by finding it to be a largely happening at the administration level, um, but to the extent that we're to sort of contribute to that conversation. We're, I'm looking for ways to do that. Maybe some concerns. We appreciate it. 
Thank you again for this opportunity. Yes, thank you. Steve wants to weigh in, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I'd like to thank the committee and the chair for having uh, having these members speak. It's really important that when you hear testimony about the libraries, you hear from people who actually work in the libraries. So um, as you can tell, they're, they're really experts in what they do. I think what VSCA, the members of the VSCA would ask this committee and the committee upstairs to consider as you make a significant commitment in both capital funds and general funds to the state colleges, that you make those appropriations contingent upon the libraries operating as the students uh, and the faculty would like those offer those those libraries to operate. So that's that's maybe explaining to you, uh, why we're in this committee because it's really the, the people of Vermont are making a significant commitment to these state colleges and uh, overwhelmingly the support uh, out there has been for the uh, the libraries as they exist today. Uh, so we'd ask you to consider that as you're considering the appropriation in the capital bill for the state colleges and making that, that appropriation continue to the libraries operating as they are today. I'll take that under consideration. I'm not making any promises because since we do markup, as you know, Steve. Yeah. We will discuss that as a committee and Thank weigh you. that. We may tailor it a little different. We don't know. For that. Thoughts, questions, anything else from folks? Anything else, Michelle or Elizabeth? No. Nope. No. Nope. I, I'm. I might just said I'm. I'm most concerned. I'm very concerned about the quality of services for the students mm -hmm. with with all of this, both with access to materials that they'll get and also just diminished staff. That is a very big concern for mine. We've worked very hard. All of us, not all of the staff, have worked very hard over the years to deliver quality service and the best that we can to help all of the students. And this plan looks like it's going to severely diminish of the quality of it. And it's, that very much worries me. Quality of service is really evident from how you speak about it. And I, I share your concern. I think my, my concern is you see in these academic settings, uh, reduced demand sort of being used to justify new services and you get a downward spiral, uh, it's very concerning. So I want to thank you both for coming in. This is very helpful. The committee has appreciated it. Um, we're not making any commitments one way or the other today because we're in the process of weighing a lot of issues, but I do want to thank you. And, and um, we really feel... Um, really feel for the position that you're both in and based on the decision that was made and also the way that it was relayed to to folks who are impacted the most uh, and the colleges yeah. Mary yeah I would encourage I would encourage them to see if they can speak before the education committee strongly recommend that that and I would also encourage before the appropriations committee as well. Yes, that that as well. So thank you both for coming in. Um, I'm glad that we could accommodate you through Zoom. It's not a very good day to travel. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So Jennifer, you have on your new hat. I have on my new hat. I'm very excited about it. And I, I feel very special. I'm not much jealous. I feel very special. Jealous. I was the only one that got the pom pom, or at least well, that's the well, way Joe sold it to me. So, you know. That's awesome. Are you the only one coming up for BGS? I am the only one coming up for BGS. You only have me today, Madam Chair. Uh oh, more trouble. I think we're in good hands. Hey, at least that little motif there, just your shirt. You like that? I mean, I see why Eric had to leave because you'd be a Christmas duo otherwise. I know, right? That would be an issue. Um, but I do. <laughs> was it you? Who was, who was the idea behind John. the hat? John. Thank you. 
It's awesome. They're gonna get your picture before we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have you leave the hat on during testimony. <laughs> Remember, you're on YouTube. I know I'm on YouTube. That's okay. Everyone is going to be reaching out so that they can have these hats made. <laughs> Well, I'm going to have to go back to the company and get it. There you go. <laughs> I was telling Joe that Joe should give his to Lauren because Lauren is the Muffin Monster Queen. <laughs> so for, for people on YouTube that aren't in on the jokes, does someone want to? Now that we. What, we, a muffin monster what, is? what is the Muffin Monster, John? Can you tell the. Remind YouTube what, what this is all about? The Muffin Monster is a device that grinds up sewage. Sheets, towels, stuff that gets flushed think, down the toilets at correctional right. facilities. Two by four, you name it. Muffin <laughs> yeah. Monster can handle it. And you should at some point get a line of all of us with our hats on yeah. at the same time. I, I'll wait and do that. I'm sure the company would do it. I'm sure I heard you got a hat too, man. I did. I did. Yeah, I didn't get a pom pom though. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, the kitty cat loves the pom pom. Oh God, don't talk to me about kitty cats. <laughs> Mine, I have another hat. I should bring in all my pom-pom hats one day. I have one where the pom-pom is detachable and the cats know it. Uh -oh. And so they will dig to try to get it out of the crate to pull it out to, to detach it. And then I have to go find where the I sold is that on, so it's probably detachable. <laughs> <laughs> they have a great time with that. <laughs> actually, it's actually very calming. Sometimes I'm in my office and so, just doing a little bit yeah. of this, you know? It's like petting the cat. It is like petting the cat. It's very calming. So thank you. You're welcome. I can use this for many different things. Now, was that <laughs> for a come out of a muffin monster? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why are we here? Yeah, right. Why are we here? <laughs> what was it we were going to talk about? No, not muffin monsters. We did get into yeah. yeah. AC. AC. Just A, yeah. Well, okay. Subset. Tay Southworth got very offended, so I will make sure I clarify at the beginning. So let me give a little background here. I'll get you started here. Last year, we in this committee put in some money. Uh, we started out at I think a million. I got cut back to half a million. Uh, to have BGS start some schematic design and working and putting air conditioning in our correction facilities. Um, the committee was really concerned about um, the situation for both staff and residents of the facilities. And I believe one or maybe two of the facilities have some air conditioning. And then we got a preliminary. Um, Rough estimate, back of the envelope estimate, which is the cost for doing all the facilities. And I forgot how many millions so it was. 19 million, 19 chair. million to do all the facilities. Um, there was a things have been said that, well, for some of the facilities, the ductwork's already there. All you have to do is flip the switch, get air conditioning in, it'll be real simple. And then when you start really looking at it, it's not as simple as what. And they think. Um, so, with a 19 million possible price tag, we gave, we put in half a million dollars for BTS last session to do some planning schematic design work in terms of how can we proceed with this. And we're doing a check in to see how far along BTS is come on that um, and where we go from here because the issue was still there. Um, and we've heard from <clears throat> and a lot of our testimony from staff, particularly in the summertime, the correctional facilities are a tough place to be. It impacts the work, it impacts the uh, livelihood of the residents there and can also contribute to the safety or non-safety practices. So we want to have an update to BGS in terms of where we are in the process, how much of the half million has been expended, and where we go from here. So, Commissioner, welcome. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you all. Um, so, for the record, my name is Jennifer Fitch, and I'm the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services. I hope you all enjoyed your week off. Thank you, Commissioner. So do. We were hoping it was going to be quiet, but it never is quiet over at BGS, so something always fills in the, the gap. Um, so thank you. Yes, I'm here to testify. Joe unfortunately had a had a conflict and is not able to be here with me today. So I'm the one that, that wins sitting in the hot seat. Um, so Madam Chair is absolutely 110% correct. $500,000 was allocated in last year's capital bill to start looking at what's titled in the capital bill is HVAC. But as I said in the beginning, Tay Southworth, who was our uh, mechanical engineer, said, it's got ventilation. They all have ventilation. So this is really about air conditioning. So I just want to make sure that we're being very clear about that, right? All of these buildings are heated. 
um, and all of them have ventilation. So we've got the heating and the ventilation piece. So it's really about the air conditioning. And then Phil, did Judy send you a presentation? She did just a little while ago. Wonderful. So that was the original name of the line item, just for folks to see it in last year's Capitol Bell. So it says DOC Correctional Facilities, HVAC Programming, Schematic Design, and Design Documents. And as we said, it's a project update. Can you go to the next slide, Phil? So um, Madam Chair is correct. We have six correctional facilities around the state, and uh, and that includes the Northeast Regional Correctional Facility and Caledonia Community Work Camp. Of the six that we have, two are fully air conditioned, and that is uh, Chittenden in South Burlington, and it's Marble Valley in Rutland. The other four correctional facilities have partial air conditioning, and we're gonna show you that. Um, and as Madam Chair said, our back of the napkin estimate was 18.6 million. I rounded up to 19 million um, to fully air condition all of these facilities. Now, again, that's back of the napkin, which is the whole point of going through planning and programming and, and getting me better numbers. Can you go to the next slide, Phil? So can you, oh, get, yes, so, um, I may be stepping ahead. No, that's okay. I, I just wanna, you know, four, four have some form of air conditioning. Is that like break rooms, air conditioning, just particular room may be air conditioned. So what I have for you is I'm not showing um, Chittenden or Marble Valley because those are fully air conditioned, but I do have layouts of all of the other facilities showing where we have air conditioning. So mm -hmm. all correctional facilities have some amount of AC. They all vary and they're all different. Most of the spaces that have air conditioning is either staff spaces or programming spaces. There are some limited areas that our incarcerated individuals are in that have some air conditioning as well. And we're happy to send over a larger floor plan if that would be um, something that would be you'd like to see. Um, but here's an example of Northern State Correctional Facility. Again, we're showing where there is air conditioned space currently. In addition to that, in the upper left-hand corner, and we have this on all of our slides, we're giving you what our initial broad brush estimate was to fully air condition all of these different facilities. So when Tay Southworth did his back of the napkin estimate, he is estimating 5.5 million to fully air condition this facility. Yes. The, the blue everywhere. Right? Where it's blue. That's no, right. that, would no. be, that would be blue. It's currently blue there. It would be blue everywhere. That's you're... correct. That is correct, Representative. That's exactly what would happen. So that's what I'm going to say. If we can go to the next slide. So oh. hold on. Let's yep. go back. Yep. Oh, all right. So we can go back. Well, that was my question. The BCI building. Um, this is Newport. Northern State. Yes, this is Newport. So Newport has BCI buildings, that's Vermont Correctional Industries. And then A1 and A2 buildings, A1 at the top is your administrative buildings. That's where your infirmary is, your administrative offices, possibly your dining hall. And then the bottom two are your living units. A1 and A2, the bottom, you scroll down to those two individual e buildings, those are living units, correct or not? They appear to be based on the layouts. So, what part of those looks like it's a right? That's a toilet right there. This looks like it's yeah, a so here. what part there seems to be air conditioned in that living unit? Is that so? A, these are day rooms right here. Okay, so what's in the other building? That's a living unit as well, right? Correct. So when you're talking about the 5.5 million, that would bring air conditioning as well into every cell? That's correct, Madam Chair. Not just the common areas would be every cell. That's correct, Madam Chair. Tristan? Now, uh, we had some cases in the last couple of years where my son's like a, there's an August heat wave, September heat wave, and they had to do a, a snow day, call snow day at the public school in my region. Um, now it gets must get pretty hot here. Um, we don't we can't do that, can we? These these folks are need to be in the facility. The workers need to be there. Yeah. So unfortunately, a DOC isn't in the room, so I can't speak uh, for sure, sure. how Operation. how they how they manage the incarcerated individuals. But it would be my understanding that you have to keep them within some perimeter. So I would assume within the fence line, but I don't know for sure. Um, so yes, your your point is well taken. The other thing that I said during the Women's Caucus, which was very true, right? 
Um, just like everything else, we talked about ASHRAE, right, and airflow and how those airflow recommendations have changed over time and they're recommending more airflow today than they were in the 1970s. So same thing, when we designed these facilities back when they were designed, we didn't have the heat that we have today. It was rare to have as many high heat days as we do now, right? So we keep talking about climate change. And as a result of that, we are starting to see some hotter, more high heat days in the summertime. It obviously varies from summer to summer, but on average, we're starting to see an increase on that over time. And Newport was built in the early 90s. This is our second newest. So 92, 93, 94. And that has about 400 inmates at this point. It's our largest facility. And I have been to Newport on a high heat day um, and they do try to do different things to help with the incarcerated individuals. So for example, they'll um, basically produce more ice and make sure that if they'd like, you know, a glass of water with ice in it, that there's ample ice in the facility to make sure that everybody can get cold, refreshing drinks. So those are the kinds of things that even if it's not fully air conditioned, they're trying to come up with other ways, right? When it's a really hot day outside. In addition to that, um, we've been working with DOC to put in more select air conditioning where it's easy to do so, where I can put in a, um, a heat pump, for example, and it's pretty easy to do that. Obviously it's harder when we talk about block wall construction, um, but where it's easy to do so, we've, we've made some modifications in the last couple of years to increase those areas. Okay. Uh, so the next facility, so this is, um, you get a twofer on a one site. So you have the Northeast State Correctional Facility and the Caledonia Community Work Camp. So here we're looking at uh, Northeast State. And again, the estimated cost to air condition both of those buildings is 2 million. So again, you can see the program building on the left. These would be cells over here. And Madam Chair, I think you know some of these facilities better than I do. Um, so the work camp is built in terms of like barracks, <clears throat> so they don't have individual cells. The work camp piece. So, and they're a separate building. So I think it's probably down where your head is, maybe where the work camp is. I can see, uh, it's hard to see with the writing, but I can see there's some garage storage space over mm -hmm. here. This looks like it might be a library, mm -hmm. based on what I can see. That would be in the, in the regular facility. But that the incarcerated me, medium security facility, but I but the work camp, I believe, is there by your head. Because it's more open. They don't have cells or anything. The work camp will be on the next slide. It's on the next one. Okay. So I don't know what that open building, maybe. Hmm. No. So let's go to the next slide there. Yeah. Sure yep, yeah, so this says administration over here. Mm -hmm. And that was also built in the mid early 90s, 92. And that was built the same time as the work camp. Not the other part of St. John's, that was there as a regional facility, but the work camp piece was added. 92, 93, 94, and there were 100 beds. 50 beds per unit there at the top. And look, Madam Chair, there's a woodshed. There is a woodshed. Yep. Yeah. I do woodshed. I try to stay out of the woodshed <laughs> as much as possible. Yep. Yeah. Previous commissioner was in a woodshed from this committee. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is Southern Sea. And this is our newest facility. And this was completed and this was built like in 98, 99, 2000, opened up around 2002. So that is the administrative building. It's all blue, right? That's the administration. Infirmary, visiting room. 
Does that include the dining room and cafeteria? Don't. I'm not sure. I don't think so. The um, font is a little easier to see. And those are the living units on the left. I would assume. If you go up a little bit on the screen, if you have, if you can, <laughs> I'm guessing that's a cafeteria. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, that's a cafeteria. Sometimes, if you do have air conditioning in a place, and then you leave it and go back to a workstation and solder. <laughs> Yeah. I can't see. I know you're blowing so up. And I appreciate that, Bill. Um, yeah, because we're so trying to zoom in here at the same time. 5. So, 5.85 million was the estimate we had. Good morning, there. Help, help where we are presentation, but it's one to three question. This is not a it is not the current. Is there a thinking on that? Is there well, a, that's why we're we'll talk about the project schedule? Yeah, okay. that's why we do markup. Yeah, so let's keep going. Wait a minute, John. Can the AC be accomplished with existing duct work? There's mm -hmm. a lot of yeah, work on top of it. So this is where it would be helpful to have Joe in the room. Um, I all I know is that you can't, to Madam Chair's point, you can't That's necessarily right. just use what you have and then stick a an air handler unit on right. top and hope that it will um, work to air condition the space in the same way we pump heat in. So I don't know the answer to that question, but it is quite complicated, right? Because the duct has to be sized appropriately. Yeah. What was the size for? Airflow, all of these different things, right? And then if we have to switch out duct work, it starts to become a pretty big project, as we've been talking about the state house. Um, and sorry, and this is Northwest State Correctional Facility, and our estimated cost was five point. I'm going to round it a little bit, but five point eight million. So that's out of St. Albans. So then the question goes back to: if we do the booking area at St. Albans, is air conditioning going to be included? in those schematic designs and the planning. So that would be a question. We can put that in as language, possibly. So those are things we can weigh. Because we might have to add on maybe a section, the building uh, for space, or we might not have to, but in the planning process, do we direct BGS and VOC to um, incorporate air conditioning in the booking area? I want to say with some level of confidence that the new uh, women's correctional and reentry, whether it's two or combined, will be fully air conditioned. For another slide? No, no, no. So, so for us, yeah. Okay. So I can talk a little bit about the project schedule. So um, right now we have started planning and programming, which eventually will lead to having some better cost estimates and timelines for what it will take to, to basically fully air condition these different types of facilities. Um, at this point, looking at the project schedule, it looks like we should have that information sometime this fall, which is a good time to consider whether or not the administration would or DOC would like to put forward a capital bill request to continue to air condition these spaces. Um, the only thing that I'll mention there is we know there's a lot of pressure on the capital bill and it's gonna be a big lift on women's correctional and reentry to get all the funding that we need in addition to the other AH facilities that we've been talking about. Um, so we've got DCF is in there for planning, for example. If, when that one moves forward, we'll be asking for more money for design and then eventually construction. We've been talking about forensics is another good example of what appears to be an unmet need right now. And so it's just air conditioning these spaces is important. There's just a lot of other things that are important too. And obviously that's what comes to your committee and you have to weigh all of those things and say, how do we wanna, how do we prioritize 
how much do we want to fund all these different initiatives? Um, so, but the timeline will work out where we should have some good estimates this fall. And then again, DOC and the administration will have to determine whether or not they want to continue to put forward a, a capital bill request, given all the other needs that they have. So the reason for putting it in last session uh, was to hope that we have some of that planning and programming done in time for us to put together the capital this year so we can figure out how to move forward. So we're behind on the planning and programming, but in almost a year. The goal was last year in this committee, why we jumped it to half a million, was to really jumpstart this so that we could figure out this session how to move forward. So of that half million, how much is going to expend? So we haven't expended any of that yet. We just got somebody under contract for planning and programming. Um, we had a couple of project managers that this was assigned to that happened to retire unexpectedly. And so it was just one of those things where it gets handed off from one PM to the next. We now have a new PM that's been with us for a couple of months. This project has been assigned to them and they've started working on it. So um, we would not have finished though, looking at the schedule, we wouldn't have finished. We'd be wrapping up sometime I would say maybe April, May, if we had been able to take it all the way from July straight through um, and didn't have any gaps in terms of the project manager's handling the project. So this is something we'll have to weigh as we do markup. People are interested in how we look forward. We're not. Um, so we'll just need to bring everybody up to speed. <clears throat> And say that you know we put in the money last year it did not come from the governor's recommended budget we put in the half million to get this started because there was concern about this within our facilities and we're still hearing it so ready to make these decisions as we do mark up questions thoughts michelle um i remember last year talking a lot about the idea of going facility by facility. So, I mean, like now you've showed us everything and what it would take to do all of them. I remember in particular, we were talking about Springfield. So with the 500,000 is the idea that we're gonna get a detailed plan about all of them, or is it just the one that we would move forward with first? You're gonna get them all. So we're gonna basically run them through. Um, I think, so we're gonna keep going in terms of going all the way to design development. I mean, the longer you progress them, the more money you're gonna spend on each one of them, right? So I think it makes sense to run them as far as we can and provide those cost estimates for all of them so that then you can make a decision as to how you wanna prioritize them, which ones you'd like to fund, when you'd like to fund them. So when we come back, we'll have a cost estimate and a timeline for each one of them. Questions? I just say I'm interested in giving a hard look at this, you know? Uh, as we're dealing with like retention, a bad day is a lot worse when you're working at 90 degree temperatures. I, I'm just looking at the contracts, you know, the non-management <clears throat> contract. We do have language around temperature and work sites that covers the majority of state employees and corrective action should be taken if it's like 85 degrees and higher there. It's silent in our DOC contract. So um, contracts give and take, but you know, in our role, I'd like to see some equity there. You said Springfield was built when? 19... 99, 2000. I can't believe they didn't. I'm surprised. Did you say this stress not just the temperature management, but you're having fine pressure? That's right. Yeah, they're getting fresh air at a standard of you know, pretty much the 70s. It's shown that doubling that actually increases your cognitive performance. Uh, so again, we want these people to folks in the incarcer in incarceration to, to do well, to see and we need to give them oxygen. I know the occupancy is a little bit different, but how many state buildings do we have where we ask employees to work that aren't air conditioned? There are very few state buildings that are not air conditioned. BGS was in one for many, many years. When you say that, though, which, which is two window eight. units are included in that? That's right. I am counting window shakers, Madam Chair. That's correct. So we do have some buildings. It's a good, it's a good um, example. So 120 is a great example. The Sorry, yeah, 120, the DMV building. Mm -hmm. The first two floors are fully air conditioned, and we put in window shakers on floors three through five. And we do that every year. Put them in, we take them out. We put the pink lady them is not air conditioned. Yeah. That is correct. I'm just trying to put in perspective. 
That is correct. Ace of Bloomer, does that air condition? Ace of Bloomer's air condition. And it's Cherry Street and Ch the ones on the Cherry and the courthouses. Are there courthouses are air conditions. The majority of our buildings are air conditions. The really old ones, you know, many of the Baldwin um, buildings are not fully air conditioned. They get one of the units, probably. They get one of the units. Yeah. How about like the Secretary of State's or the Auditor of Accounts or Agency of yeah. Ag, the other buildings in the Capitol Complex? <laughs> there are some across the street that are air conditioned and some that are not. Again, it tends to be your older buildings that look a lot like the pink lady next door are the ones that are not air conditioned. Yeah, that's why. And I don't asked. know what happened to DMB. I don't know why we would have air conditioned. I wasn't here. I'm not sure why we would have air conditioned two floors, but not air conditioned the other three. Probably because the public comes in. I think that's what it was. We weren't worried about state and cost. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of times things get cut out of a project because we're trying to meet the bottom line. Right. Of the bonding process. Or project cost gets too high, and we say, "Yeah, hey, you gotta cut something." So some things go otherwise. And I remember being in the laundry building on the Waterbury State Office Complex before Tropical Storm Irene as an intern, and that was not air conditioned. No, that was not. And I remember as an intern, it was great because they would send us home. I think it's 84 degrees in the contract, but I could be wrong on that. But every once in a while as an intern, because I had a couple of other fellow interns with me, we'd get the email to say, it's too hot, go home and you go find a swimming hole. So from that perspective, it was great. But um, yes, we do have limitations in the contract, including both the low and the high end. And it's our job and responsibility to do those. Problem is, is when you're in a facility such as our secure residential or our state hospital or our correctional facility, where it's 24 7, we don't have that much. Other questions? Thoughts? Come on in, Vince. And okay. I, got, I got confirmation through Eric that we are planning to fully air condition, which I had assumed and I believe I heard for when it's fresh on the entry. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the state of the art now. Yeah. I agree. I believe, I don't want to make a huge overarching statement um, that we can't fulfill, but I would assume that any facility that we build from this point forward would be air conditioned. Mm -hmm. It's more cost effective to design it in at the outset. So so there's a metric that's like a full air conditioning. Which one? Bennington. I don't know. That one is like quasi. Which one? Mm -hmm. Bennington yes. State Office? The no. Veterans. Oh, the vets oh, home? Home? I don't know. I think it's small. I think it's something just on water for the. You mean the geothermal? Yeah. Remember, brain can only hold so much information. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you, Commissioner. All right, thank and you. And we'll talk about this as a committee. We're going to continue. We're going to be on markup all week, so make sure you have your folks around. I'm sure if you're doing markup, Eric will be, we'll be sitting on the bench, yeah. Madam Chair. Yeah, hopping along. That's right. <laughs> Stop not texting me because when he starts texting me, I get I have to just walk away. <laughs> all I want to do is run over and be like, "No, we really need our major bean. It's funny, but." I understand the process and I understand the process. And we, we, and we go through it. And so we did last year. <laughs> well, did you see that? A little, little, uh... I did. Anything else? Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I do love my hat. So I'm very right. excited. And I do think that we should get a group picture with everybody wearing their hats. The right. Muffin Monster. I love it. But it looks like you may want to get your own needle and thread out. <laughs> I do the four forward. Would you get the pom pom? You buy a half of a pom pom? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> That's terrific. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Yeah, take, take care. care. Bye. Bye. Okay. So, will we finish up for the day? Thoughts? Questions? 8 30 tomorrow. Yeah, 8 30. So I guess I have one question. I mean, is it possible that we could just put in our recommend that we want to get started on one project? I mean, we, we have, an, do we have enough ideas that we could say, start moving forward and we want to put a million dollars towards Springfield or something? We can do that, but find a million bucks. I mean, we, 
nickel and dimed a bunch of stuff up there. Well, what we call nickel and dime, isn't it? <laughs> you got to balance, you gotta balance in terms of other needs too in the building. Yeah, you know, but we haven't finished markup. Not through markup because we got the cash run. And then we also have bonding capacity issues. So I'd like to spend some time be thinking to, for tomorrow. There's language changes or language that people would like to put around some of the items. Um, I know I mentioned 108 Cherry. There's some benchmarks there. Uh, 110 State Street, Montpelier, first right of refusal. I think Bill Fraser said something on that. Yeah, there's something there if we want to do anything with that. The Waterbury, Stanley, and Wasson. We want to do anything there. Waterbury having first right of refusal, but there needs to be some benchmarks that are met maybe before that. Um, the women's reentry facility, the replacement, and uh, state colleges. There was a thought put on the table there. What am I missing here? So folks can be thinking about that. And if we can kind of coalesce around what some language change like would like attached to some of the money that will help Becky as she starts to put the language of the bill together and then she can draft something and then we can refine it as we look through for that. So if you folks can be thinking about that. So tomorrow when we start, if you can remind me that we can start at that point and that will help Becky. We get the draft going. And Phil, do you know when Becky can come back in for the she's, arts? She's coming in between 10 and 11. Okay. So that's a wrap for today. Hope people drive safely. It's snowing out, or if you have some place to go, or home, or whatever, just drive careful. And uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully the weather's better tomorrow. So let's zoom up. We're going to go off of YouTube, or do you need? I'm just asking, didn't you give us a copy of last year's bill? Yep, somewhere. I thought so. Yeah, last year's January, bill. I think you got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah last year's That gives bill. us a better idea on how the wordage might be created. Something, yeah, you can look at that. You also have the original bill that we did, the two-year bill as well. You also have that. Okay. Um, they were, you want to look it up online, during the session 21-22, it was Act 50 and Act 180 for that. Um, what are the Act numbers? Uh, for session 21 and 22, you've got to go back to that session, uh, right. Act 50 and Act 180. So let's go off of YouTube and we will be back tomorrow morning at